very lucky to have an amazing local Indigenous person by the name of Michael Ware, who is a Morgana traditional owner. And he's from the Tidal Moon Sea Cucumbers Project. Hmm. So Interesting. What's that about? I'm, I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> it's fascinating, though. I, I read a little bit about it and went, oh, my goodness. So it will be a really good and interesting, interesting keynote that touches on a lot of things. And interesting that it's sea cucumbers that, that will bring it all together. G'day, I'm Rob Maliki. I'm the CEO of the Global Society, coming to you today from Garrigal Land in Sydney. And I'm Dirk Mulder, founder of the Quail News, and I'm coming to you from Wajuk Noongar uh, country in Perth, Western Australia. Great to see you again, Dirk. First thing this week, I thought, just seen some great new names on the Koala and News. Tracy Harris, Arcos Kirillay, and of course, Alan Olson now all writing for you. Well done, mate. Some some great new additions to, to, the, to the service. Yeah, mate, I'm, I look absolutely chuffed and uh, honoured and humbled, if I can say that. Like you say, you know, certainly, I mean, Tracy and Alan are, are very well known here in Australia. And Arcos has a long history coming from Germany. And you know, I remember Arcos from working with him with Hilke back in the day. And it's, it's amazing, you know, to think that international education creates those people to people links and those relationships maintain over such a long period of time. And it's wonderful to be able to collaborate with people that you've worked with in the past and, and, and develop friendships with over many years. So again, um, all fantastically insightful in their own ways. And, and again, humbled to have them as part of the koala. It's, it's wonderful. I'm really enjoying the fact that every time I open it up, I see some of these names, people that I know well, and I might not have spoken to them for six months or maybe even 12 months, but then I sort of feel like I'm having that personal conversation again in the conference hall or, you know, on the phone. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm talking to Tracy again. And of course, you know, the writing style's still there. It's fantastic. I'm just, I'm just loving it. So just great to see how things are, are growing and growing. Yeah, I agree. And it's funny when they send the stories in, it's almost like I hear their voices as I'm reading the stories. So I, I agree hundred percent. It's, it's been my, it's fantastic to have them on board and wonderful again to, to be able to collaborate with them. So on to the news then, what is top of mind for you this week? I think I know where we're going to start. I think you, you might be right. I mean, I, I'll, I'll give it some context. I guess the last time we spoke, we, we spoke about Canada and, and visa caps and you know, the, the UK has been added as well. Mate, it's starting to bite here in Australia where, you know, there's been a visa slowdown and there's lots of providers. I think, you know, probably for the last few weeks, there's been anecdotal sort of evidence floating around, around visa rejections, visa slowdowns, those sorts of things going on. There hasn't been too much coming from the government in terms of acknowledgement of that, which has been disappointing. But, mate, we, we crunch some stats and there's probably some demonstrative evidence now to, to show that, that rejections are up. And there is a slowdown. So, mate, the overall grant rate in Q4 for 2023, which was released in January, is at 82.5%. And that's the, the lowest since records began in, in 2005. Three largest largest sectors, higher ed, vet, and Elicos, all individually experienced their lowest grant rates over, you know, what, essentially since, since records have been done. So if you compare that to, to Q4 of 2019, and obviously that's the, the, the last, Q to, uh, last quarter before the border shut, these top three sectors saw 8% more visas being considered for a grant. So, so we're seeing more students coming through the flow, but it saw 119% more applications rejected. And while much of the government's rhetoric in, in their responses have, have been you know, around the immigration reports, have been aimed at ghost colleges and, and, and quality we're now seeing that these rejections are, are starting to bite. So in Q4, for example, the number of visas processed for higher education, and again, when we talk about, you know, the, the international education system in Australia, higher education is really the, you know, the bull in the china shop on this one. They were a third higher, so they're up 33% from just below 49,000 and just uh, below 65,000 student visa applications. However, the number of rejections are more than triple, so they're up 236% from just over 3,000 to well over 10,000. And of these rejections, 65% were applications from India and Nepal, which both saw triple the number of rejections in Q4 2023 versus Q4 in 2019, despite the number of applications only being 12% higher. So we're definitely seeing slowdowns. We're seeing slowdowns more so in particular regions, obviously India and Nepal. 
and and it's it's mate it's biting like i said the the amount of providers that i've spoken to over the last sort of two to three weeks it's impacting it's impacting business you know when when students can't get visas what a college is doing they're refunding money so they're not concentrating on teaching they're not concentrating on student experience they're in the back office making sure that money goes back out for people who can't make it and and that's really really kind of sad one of the things that came in was actually a an email or a story a letter from a Pakistani student and it was it actually called really I mean it kind of hit me hard because it's the human side of what's going on right so we can talk about providers and business going down in the sector we can talk about migration overall but when you put yourself when you center this around the student you know this student's experience was that they've already had to defer once because they didn't have an outcome they've now been waiting five months for an outcome and and they and you know they're they're wanting to start studying you know coming up at a major university here in Australia you know, a very highly ranked institution and they're considering what to do now. So what do they do? Do they continue, you know, knocking on Australia's door or they start looking elsewhere? And, you know, certainly this student, I think, is now starting to look at the UK. And it's hard, isn't it? Because it's like, just life is on hold. I remember reading, on reading on. that article and, and seeing how since about the middle of last year, applications from from Pakistan, basically the rejection rate have just been just dropping dropping through the floor almost down to zero. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just even in terms of visa processed, you know, if you look at October data for last year, there was literally nothing coming out of Pakistan. People I've been speaking to in the last week before, as I wrote that story and, and sources uh, were telling me that they're now starting to hear uh, out of Pakistan, but most of them are seeing rejections and, and they're not coming through in, in large quantities. There's just a trickle. So it's, again, it's one of those things that you just think, you know, could we be doing this better? And and what are the longer term ramifications of of what's going on at the moment to Australia's place in the global system? You know, we talk about soft power. We talk about the wonderful experience that students have when they come here and and how they take that back to their home country. What does this do for those students who are knocking on the door, knocking on the door, knocking on the door, not hearing anything, not hearing anything, and they may get a rejection? And then what happens? You know, seven hundred and ten dollars now for an Australian visa application. Yeah, you know, it's not, it's not it's not cheap. So you start talking about those sorts of things, and and you know potential loss of money, loss of face. You know, I mean, you think about just you or I wanting to say travel to the United States or or another country, and you put in a visa application, and you think, yeah, yeah, you know, I've I've done all this, and 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 institutions have pre vetted. You know, we've we've got visa regimes in place now where institutions are, are moving piles and piles of paperwork to make sure that these students are bona fide, that they're going to meet those visa requirements. And now they're still not. And it's it's mate, it's it's not a good situation to be in, that's for sure. I think you're spot on the money there, Dirk. The fact that this whole system has been put in place to have institutions have their ranking or their band, if you like, mm. and to go through this entire process of validating students and making sure they're genuine, for that student then to be rejected further down the line just seems to lack transparency. And and perhaps that's one of the worst parts of it, isn't it? Is that it when is. people don't know, they don't have information, they don't know what the time frame is going to be and it's opaque, it just erodes trust. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you're talking about individual students, that's one thing. But then when that becomes systemic, that has, yep. I think, a, a significant downside risk to to the entire mm-hmm. industry. Mate, you're absolutely right. And that, you know, that downside is going to grow. So, you know, at the moment, for those that aren't familiar with the university or the, or a provider's place in this visa system, you know, they're categorised one through three, you know. So if you're getting visas through and you've got good students that, that are, are doing all the right things and you're doing that on scale, then you'll generally be a level one and you'll be, for the want of a better word, a trusted provider. What we now risk is the entire system collapsing. And, and what I mean by that, and I know that might be a little bit over the top and some 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 listeners might say, mm, yeah, not sure about that. But the situation now is whether you're a university or whether you're more so if you're a private provider or an English college, if you've been a level one or two and you're getting mass visa rejections, the chances are that you're going to go down to two or three. And if you go down to two or three, it's going to be harder for you to get students through the visa system. People who are running on, again, smaller colleges that are, are good colleges um, they're now looking down the line that in 12 months' time, what's their position going to be in terms of attracting students? We do really run the risk here of what was a system that should promote quality is now not promoting quality at all. It's promoting 
uh, a smaller visa system, a smaller visa intake, and and the losers out of that are going to be institutions in this visa system. So I think one of the things that if we keep going down this track, the government is going to have to face, and 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 you know, there's going to be lots of lobbying on this one, is what does this ranking system, this one, two, three ranking system of providers actually achieve now? Because if people are being rejected without any, you know, as you say, transparency, then, you know, what position are these people going to be in? And, you know, the, the, the system itself is going to fall over by the fact that colleges are going to go out of business for no other reason that visas are being rejected that have been previously tested and sought to be good and would have passed two, three months ago. Yeah, mate, it's, 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 a, it's a bit of a sad one. And, you know, it's not a, not a good one to, you know, be talking about, quite frankly. It's, you know, it's a bit somber. On a similar topic, sideways, I suppose. I mean, what, we've seen Brendan O'Connor out in the news again talking about the ghost colleges and the dodgy providers. And yep. there, there has been news come out. Tracy, Tracy Harris wrote on this for, for the Koala that the Australian mm. Skills Quality Authority have uh, cancelled registrations. So they're mm-hmm. out there taking action. And mm-hmm. also, I think it's something like 35 Providers cancelled right. and another, I want to say half dozen, six or eight, yep. have had their eight, registrations. Yep. Eight, there we go, suspended. Yep. But felt like there's also more in the works. Brendan O'Connor in, in the news was talking about how any training provider that hasn't had students through the door in 12 months likely to have their, their license cancelled, which in some ways, honestly, it probably, probably makes sense to me. I mean, a business hmm. that's supposed to be training students and isn't bringing in students probably should, should have to go through some other processes to make sure that uh, yeah. they're doing their job properly. But it seems like that whole theme that the government has been onto since last year around tightening up the loopholes is continuing and we're, we're seeing real action taking place you know, early this year. Yeah, absolutely. And look, that's, again, I think that's welcome. You know, any, any college that's not doing the right thing, you know, Let's 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 get them out of the system. But you know, there's caught up in that. There's good colleges as well, and that's the that's that's the really difficult bit. So you know, let's hope Asqua really have their eyes and ears open. You know, again, I, I go back to the point that I think I made two podcasts ago, where you know, if a if a reporter for for a TV station can walk down Queen Street in Melbourne and and walk in the front door of somewhere, and the job can't be too hard. So let's hope that you know that quality aspect remains and that's a really good thing from that perspective. But let's also hope that, you know, bona fide students going to good colleges are able to get visas. Alan Olson also back in the news doing an analysis around the Times Higher Ed World University ranking. So it's that time of year. Again, do you want to take us through some of the main main things coming yeah, out this year? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I, you know, I think listeners will say rankings are good, rankings are bad, rankings don't make a difference, rankings this, rankings that. What I love about what Alan did was actually put some perspective around some of the statistics that have come out of these rankings. So you can argue, you know, who should be in the top 200 or top 500 and, and those sorts of things. However, when you look across countries, what Alan's done is actually benchmarked essentially Australia, the UK and the US And there's some fascinating data that's come out of it. Australia has 32 universities in the top 500 and nine outside of it. The UK has 53 universities in the top 500 with 88 outside of it. The US has 102 universities in the world's top 500 and 2,517 four-year universities outside of it. What that translates to, which I think is is fascinating and really puts Australia onto a really good pitch here, is that 88% of the students in Australian universities are within the world's top 500. I reckon that's a pretty bloody good stat, mate. In the UK, that's 45%. And in the US, it's only 23%. So when you look at the quality overall of Australian education, those statistics really ring ring through. And and that's sometimes I you know forgotten when you just look at the top end of town and, and say, you know, how many does, how many Australian universities are in the top ten or the top twenty or the top fifty versus the US or the UK. What it really says is is that the education system in Australia is of really high quality. And you know, that's something that we should be really, really proud of here in Australia. But I remember interviewing Nick Klomp, the vice chancellor of CQ University a few years yep. ago for my YouTube channel, Choosing Your Uni. And that was the number one thing that, that was the first thing he opened up with was, doesn't matter if you're watching this, this video from, you know, somewhere in Australia, you know, remote regional Australia or from the other, other side of the world, the first thing to know is that the overall level of quality of our education system here is amongst the very, very best in the world. So it doesn't matter which uni you end up going to, you're mm. going to get a great education here. And these stats year after year just continue to, to reinforce that. Yep. Agreed. Which is funny, Agreed. actually, when you think about it. I'm just, just sort of putting those two 
news points together, right? The the fact that on one hand we've got this, you know, ama these amazing results, and then on the other hand you've got this sort of declining, you know, visa approval rates and and the shutting down of uh, the sort of dodgy do dodgy dodgy providers. I know all this kind of mixes in together, doesn't it? It sure does. It's yeah, it's incredible. It's a fascinating. It's why we do what we do, right? It's it we 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 love what we do, and 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 we should be celebrating the wins along the way, but making sure that the wins stay as wins and and you know that's a constant challenge so it's what we strive to do another good article i picked up from tracy earlier in the week so <laughs> two two shots and two hits in a week mate. it's not, not not too bad she's come out all, she's come out all, all guns blazing all, all guns blazing and just just such an important topic but around how the media really like mainstream media really just sometimes misses the point on international education and, and what it's all about. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There was a story uh, written in the Canberra Times last week and it asked the question, and, and this is a really interesting one, it asked the question, why are Australian universities accepting overseas students who would struggle to get into a high quality university in their own country? And it's just, I've got to say, it's a bit of a naive question um, and it just shows a real lack of understanding of international education, admissions, access, and, and how all that works. So the first, I, the first point is they may not. They might actually choose for a, a more portable degree. And and you know certainly an education degree from Australia, the US, the UK, New Zealand, Canada, they're going to be a lot more portable and a lot more demanding, uh, a lot more in demand, should I say, right across the globe. So so there's that aspect to it. The other aspect, which I, when I read this first from Tracy, I, it really dawned on me. If you go back to the 1980s, and you know, for many of our listeners, they won't remember that, but and I'm, we're now showing our age. The Dawkins set of reforms in Australia set up a whole bunch of institutions, and it was all about access to high quality education. So my question, I guess, or my, my retort is, imagine if those reforms hadn't have gone through, that question would apply to Australia. If there were only 12 or 15 institution, higher education institutions or universities in Australia, where would the majority of students who attend, as you say, CQ, and that was one of the Dawkins you know, institutions, Western Sydney University, massive institution now, high quality, where would those students be going to study? Yeah, and the question is they wouldn't be in Australia. So similarly, when you think about a country, you know, and I'm just you know, randomly speaking, you know, a country like Bhutan, their population may not be able to actually accommodate all of their minds or all of their the available minds in their own higher education institution sector. So being able to come to another country, I mean, India is a great example. You know, they just can't accommodate the amount of students coming through into their own system. And some of the brightest minds in India actually choose to go to the United States or they choose to go to Australia or the UK. And that's been a tradition in that country for a very, very long time. So the notion that mainstream media puts out that we're accepting students that can't get into their own institutions in a high quality way is just a furphy. And what it does is that the average punter out there reads something like this and it puts our sector in a really, really bad light. So when we're trying to build a social license around uh, educating people globally and the benefits of that, the benefits to our own communities, the benefits to the communities that they return to just erodes a lot of that social license. So, mate, you're right, and Tracy's right. Mainstream media needs to do better. It's not, you know, it's not all journalists, but some journalists need to do better at understanding our sector and being able to report on it accurately. It's just, it's a very two D way to look at it, isn't it? Mm. It just completely yeah, it's good way to put it. nuances of absolutely everything else that international education brings to Australia. So. Yeah, and I think we've talked about this bit before on the podcast about the fact that mm. as a sector, we also need to do a much better job in getting the knowledge or raising the knowledge of, of the work that gets done and the importance mm. of the work that gets done in, in the general community. I, I continue to be baffled why, why, why the government itself wouldn't want to spend some money actually getting that message out there. Of course, it's more money to be spent, but it's such a good positive thing for the, for the cultural fabric of this country. It would be fantastic to actually see them investing more, as we know, $5 million spent on Australian international education and what was it? <laughs> Tens of millions on, on tourism. So yep. what is there to say, Dirk? No, you're absolutely right. But it's the old adage, mate. There's no votes in education. There's no votes in education. Moving on, the story of Wollongong in India continues to move forward. 
Yeah, absolutely. So Wollongong's followed very closely. And this last week, they've announced that applications are open for a July start in their new campus located in Gift City, which is in Gujarat, the same place that, that Deakin's opening. But it's wonderful again. I mean, I we, you know, we spoke about Deakin being the first. It's wonderful to see that an Australian university, well, now two Australian universities, are the first two movers in India post their education reforms and you know best of luck to Wongo. it's fit it's you know it's, it's a fantastic move and let's hope it's a, it's a successful one you know what just popped into my mind you know deacon being first in and Wongong hot on their heels just made me think about when university of melbourne moved to the melbourne model the three-year degrees plus two-year yeah. master and very shortly thereafter university of western australia essentially right. did the same but yep. melbourne sort of captured all of that noise and all yep. of that attention with the Melbourne Melbourne model. And I think it's such an interesting factor when it comes to, you know, there's such long time frames when it comes to developing programs and curriculum and relationships and all these sorts of things. I'm, I'm wondering if somewhere in Wollongong, somebody's not sitting there just being like, drat, if we just, <laughs> two weeks earlier, it's true. it would have been us. <laughs> so true, right? So true. Yes. So fingers crossed that all washes out in the next no, couple of years and, uh, and and we forget about that because it's uh, two early movers who've obviously been in that region for a long time hmm. doing the hard yards and building the relationships and, and committing to the communities over there and hopefully they, they both those programs thrive as a result. Absolutely. And just quickly, Rob, before we bring in our guest, Dr. Anna Kent, who's well known in the sector, has released her first book. And it's called Mandates and Missteps, Australian Government Scholarships to the Pacific, 1948 to 2018. The book looks at different scholarship programs in the Pacific over that time, their goals, their design, and the politics behind them. And one of the things that I think in talking with Anna about this is that, you know, obviously the Colombo Plan has gotten a lot of attention over recent times. There's a lot of work that went on in the Pacific prior to the Colombo Plan. Even This is going to be a really interesting read for those that are, are interested in, in that area. All right, Rob, shall we bring in our guest? Let's do it, Dirk. Excellent. Well, we're fortunate today to be joined by Louise Kinnaird, who's the Executive Director of API, or the Asia-Pacific Association of International Education, or API for short. Louise, welcome. Big month ahead. API returns to Australia, I think, since 2016, was last in Melbourne. It's now heading over to Perth. How's it all going? Oh, yes. Well, thanks for that introduction. I know our association name is a bit of a mouthful, so we can just go with API on that, much easier. Yeah, it's it's exciting to come back to Australia. It has been a while. In fact, that was my introduction to API was when it was in Melbourne in 2016. Yeah, nice. So yeah, coming back. And the other thing is we're on the other side of Australia now and we share the same time zone as a lot of our delegates that are coming. So that helps us too. Yeah, absolutely. And so coming back to Perth, obviously Perth's probably going to be a little bit smaller than what it may have been, say, last year in Thailand. And obviously coming off the back of COVID and, and people wanting to re-inject each other in, in international education. I think I saw the numbers earlier, somewhere around the 2000 mark. Is that right? Look, we're, we're hoping to get 2000. Look, I'd, we may not quite get to 2000 because of that, that whole post-COVID buzz. We knew that Bangkok was going to be a big one to come mm. out of COVID with and just with the extra challenges and coming to Australia and everything. But we have got an amazing number coming to, to Perth and an exciting program ahead too. The Perth locals have really put it on. So, yeah, it's, it would definitely be a fun event to attend. Yeah, being a Perth local, I know that we, we do enjoy having people come and visit our city and show it off. So I know uh, Study Perth and some of the host institutions are actually hosting some events pre and post. So that's really good for the delegates, not just to, I guess, experience the conference itself, but be able to experience some of the institutions and some of the fanfare that Perth has to offer. It's a beautiful city and obviously I love living here, but I'm really excited to share that with with delegates that are coming in. In terms of the program itself, I understand that you've just locked in the keynote speaker. Is that right? Yes. Very lucky to have an amazing local Indigenous person by the name of Michael Ware, who is a Morgana traditional owner. And he's from the Tidal Moon Sea Cucumbers Project. Hmm. So Interesting. What's that about? I'm, I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> it's fascinating though. I, I read a little bit about it and went, oh my goodness. So it will be a really good and interesting, interesting keynote that touches on a lot of things and interesting that it's sea cucumbers that that will bring it all together but you've got you know like he's the custodian of indigenous culture the environmental protection the sustainability just making sure that things continue on for the next generation yeah so I think people will be quite fascinated by a very different type of keynote 
Yeah, that's fantastic. What sorts of things are on the program for this year, Louise? Or what are, what are you expecting some of the hot topics to be? Well, the, I mean, the, the theme for the event is collaborating for sustainable impact partnerships across the Asia Pacific. So that's quite broad, but it's also quite relevant in this day and age, particularly the sustainability angle. There's such a variety in the program, I can't really highlight any one thing, but one of the new things that we're doing for API 2024 that we haven't done before is we're bringing in a student voice. So on the middle day of the conference, we will have a plenary session that will, will give us all the opportunity to hear what students think. So that'll be an interesting one to, to attend and to see how the delegates react to it too. Yeah, vitally important, isn't it? I mean, what we spoke about earlier was around visas and some of the slowdowns. To actually see that human voice and that student voice brought into education and being the centre of what we do, I've I've long been an advocate for that. And it's not just about how institutions go about things, but it's about how they actually support students and actually take on board the student needs and wants and 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 how they make that student journey as, as good as possible. So I think that's fantastic. It's one of those things, I think, that when you step back from you know the, the daily business of international education, if I can put it that way, and actually start seeing and hearing some of these stories, it's... It's one of the reasons that I love the sector so much to see students, you know, when they're in their you know, late teens, early 20s, they're bright eyed and bushy tailed and they're seeing the world for the first time. And fast forward 20 or 30 years and, you know, the soft diplomacy that, that occurs through international education, the people to people links, it's just so important. And, and you know, Amit as a vice chancellor is a, is a great example of that. And we're also talking about that, like, there was a group who was standing around at one of these events and we had all been an international, had that international student experience. And we were saying, look at where we are. What's going to happen now that we've had a couple of years of a whole bunch of people missing out on that? Yeah. How is that going to impact later on their careers? So, you know, it's, you just don't know. It's so true. It's so true. Mm. We've been talking about that too quite, quite a lot, you know, the, the facts that these sorts of experiences – I think, become a defining feature, particularly for universities, of, of the education experience as a whole, your ability to move around the world and experience education at different institutions. Because otherwise, what's the difference between, you know, where, where's, the, where's the difference if we're going to get an education driven by a bot that's personalising our education in our bedroom? Like, where's the actual experience? I mean, it's the student experience on the ground, the human experience that makes such a big difference. So to me, it makes a lot of sense to be getting those students in front of practitioners to, to hear firsthand, to make sure that that's becoming front and centre. And you can't do it, as you said, through a bot or even even virtually because a lot of a lot of what you experience as an international student, it's not just the language, it's not just the lessons, it's the, it's the whole package, just how to physically get there, the lifestyle, the weather, the food. It's just everything in together that you cannot get that in any other form other than actually being there and doing it. Yeah, one of the things that I always used to speak about when I um, when I was in management uh, at university in the international area was around that orientation experience. And it's about, I mean, as silly as it sounds, it's catching that first bus, it's catching that first train. It's all of those things that you don't necessarily think are important. But I remember when I first travelled, you know, getting off the plane in Los Angeles and, you know, the cars being on the other side and just the busyness of it and just the different noises and the different smells. And it's it's all of that experience, as you say, Rob, that's just you, you can't get through a computer and being able to navigate that you know builds resilience and it's it's that soft education you know that old iceberg analogy of you know the formal education happens that you can see there's so much happening under the water that that just doesn't occur to you or, or is really that life-changing building resilience type stuff that you just can't get elsewhere so yeah completely completely agree and that's also like when you attend these conferences, part of it is, yes, the formal meetings that you have and the sessions that you go to, but a lot of it is also the informal, incidental mm. contacts that you make. And it's usually, you know, you see someone, you're crossing paths between sessions and they say hi and then they've got somebody else and next thing you know, you've got some amazing program that you've worked out between three different countries to help X number of students. <laughs> So true. Oh, you know what, Louise? As you're talking, I'm getting massive FOMO. I'm not <laughs> Me too. Right now, right now I'm getting all those messages from people <laughs> every time I send an email and get a reply. It's saying, so I'm seeing you at Appi in a couple of weeks' time. I'm like, oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, so all those messages are now coming through. And the messages I'm now getting are getting into the, you know, more important bits. How do I see a cocker on Rottnest Island? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Absolutely. How, how to guide required. I'm just looking at the website. So good to see some some sponsors up there too that you know haven't seen before. But Duolingo, I mean, obviously making a, their presence known here in Australia, Diamond sponsor. That's really exciting. 
That is really exciting. They're here to promote their English test. They need to get word out about that. They're doing amazing things as far as English testing goes. Yes. I'm nearly a four-year streak on Duolingo, so love the platform. (laughs) (laughs) So it's great to see them moving into the space. And I think having that kind of enormous brand influence and brand recognition can only be good good for the sector, you know, really disruptive in terms of moving things forward and taking things in a different direction. So that's exciting. And then a couple of institutions, Hanyang and the University of the Philippines there as as platinum sponsors is fantastic as well. So it's great to see organizations getting behind API and continue to support your good work. What what's what are some of the other things that uh, that are on your agenda for the year that you the association's working on or looking towards or thinking about? Oh, that's a big question. I've recently engaged another employee. So now there's two of us. Yay. Yay. <laughs> and she's looking after our, like she's going to be our canny officer. So looking after the Climate Action Network of International Education. So looking after all our climate action plans and really trying to make sure we're not just meeting the targets, but we're challenging ourselves for it. I think that's more important than ever these days. It can be challenging when we're organising big events to try and stick to some of it, but, you know, we have to meet those challenges. So she's looking at projects along those lines and also working with some of our other API Advisory Council members on some other programs to run that members, that the API community is really after to do between the conference. So between the annual conferences, we'll have smaller targeted events that, that really serve the sector. So we're, we're still doing research on that side of it. So I don't want to give away too much now or say something that doesn't happen. But yeah, watch this space and there will be things coming out. One of the other things we're really excited about is we have the Western Australian Chief Scientist, Professor Peter Clinken, will be speaking at a breakfast session. So that's new and that's organised by the host universities. Looking forward to that one. I really love that kind of that kind of session, personally. You know, that, that kind of morning where you wake up, you've had a great night out and you, you're warming up over coffee. and you know, getting someone like a chief scientist is, is a great move because they really not only have the education perspective but have this total different perspective on the world and you're always guaranteed to learn something. So that's that's a fantastic inclusion. Well, Louise, it's been an absolute pleasure having you and all the best next month for the API conference in Perth. I certainly look forward to being there and I know that Rob, as he mentioned, has a bit of FOMO on it. So we're, we're looking forward to the, to the conference itself and thanks again for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the event too. And as always... For all of your up-to-date international education news, thekoalanews.com is the place to go. And I'm from the Global Society. I help out with Learning Abroad Program. So if you need anything with your Learning Abroad Program, please check us out, globalsociety.com.au. Dirk, as always, thanks for keeping us up to date with everything that's going on. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. Look forward to it, Rob. Thank you. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney, and we pay our respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>